Oh. Dave, thank you for joining me today for Give Me a Break. Now, weren't you an engineer at one time, Dave? Yes, I was, yeah. That's many years ago, yes. Yeah. So did um, you train at college or uni Yes, I did, yeah. I was trained at college, yeah. I did um, an off-the-job training at, in a factory to start with for 12 months. And then I did an indentured apprenticeship, as they called it, which made basically you were tied to that firm for a number of years. Five years, I think it was. So you did a 52 week, I think it was, or 48 week off the job training. That was in a training school uh, where you went to college as well for the theory side. Although they did teach some of the maths that related to engineering at, the, at Brockhouse is where I actually was apprenticed. And then basically then you went out into the factory and around different departments within the factory. And then you were trained, you went to college for a technological certificate. And then I went on to do a degree oh, in engineering. Well done. Well, Did you enjoy yeah. that type of work? I did, yeah, I enjoyed it. But I don't know whether I would have gone into it again. Right, I okay. would have done something else. Okay, yeah. but you enjoyed it at the time? Yeah, I did, yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. Dave, I know I'm that sorry. you don't mind getting your hands dirty in the garden. No. So no. tell us a bit about that today. Right, OK. Um, well, I think I picked up a gardening from my uncle that used to live with us because he was a keen gardener. My father wasn't a keen gardener. He'd eat what was grown in the soil, but he wouldn't work to produce it, if you know what I'm saying. Um, and I think today, obviously, with supermarkets, a lot of the children think these things just appear on the shelves <laughs> magically, that there's no process, you know. And obviously, I think from my uncle, I learned the process of um, and a few gardening tips. I found gardening very th therapeutic. Everything started in a garden. That, that was deliberate by God, to create a garden. His garden was a, para, a garden of paradise, really, for, for the first man to live in. Obviously, we know what happened, and we went away from that. But um, And he taught me, getting back to the basics of it, I think he taught me not to worry about getting my hands dirty, as you say. Because you can't be a gardener without getting your hands dirty. No. <laughs> I don't think so anyway. <laughs> um, uh, and then obviously he didn't have a greenhouse when I was uh, lived with him at, at home. But when I um, left home and I got married, um, my father-in-law, he was a king gardener as well. Okay. And uh, he made a, a, guard, a, a greenhouse out of it. When they replaced his windows, because he lived in a council house, he fixed all the windows together and made a greenhouse. Wow. That was his first greenhouse. I had the um, unenviable pleasure of taking it down with him <laughs> when he bought his first greenhouse. I cut my finger, I've still got the scar today on, on one of the panes of glass, but that's how I remember him. Um, and he introduced me into sort of using greenhouses and obviously the disadvantages and the advantages of having a greenhouse and all the plants you could grow even in the winter if you eated it and things like this so um yeah it, i and i think um gardening grows on you to, to use a phrase it does um and it's a calming influence i think uh, yes. very th therapeutic in your life yeah. Yeah. yeah so you see god in creation how oh, do you definitely. see god in creation dave well, I remember talking to a chap uh, at work and Freemasonry. He was in the Freemasons. Okay. And when I spoke to him about God, he says, he's the architect of the universe, you know. We study that. And I thought to myself, I didn't agree with some of the things he said. And mm. later he left. He left the Freemasons. Mm. I thought to myself, the architect of the universe. Yeah. And everything that was created was created by him and for him with his design and the function 
what he wanted, the purpose for what he wanted it to carry out. Now, we know things went wrong, but it wasn't because they were designed fault with God. No. It was because he gave us free will. You and know? sin came into the world. And sin came into the world. But I think that was purposely introduced to bring about his greater plan. But of course, that's in the predestinated will of God. We're going to really depth. It's, it's interesting, you know, to think that God created all the plants. And we know there's been uh, things have changed and uh, plants have changed through the centuries to survive, which they have. Do you find that it helps reduce stress and makes you oh, feel definitely, happier? Definitely does. Because yeah. uh, in a garden, although we talk about instant colour, we get the bedding plants to create instant colour, you see, so we don't have to raise them by seed, but they're all, and then they they proliferate, to use a gardening term, they grow abundantly, yes. very, very quickly, but they only do it for a short period of time. Annual, sometimes I call them, they just last for one year, and they basically give glory to God in colour and beauty to the world around them. But in doing it, they um, exhaust the self very, very quickly, and then they die. And then you get some more. But really, when, when you look at the Christian aspects of um, growing things and growing, we're perennials. We planted and we grow, but we last. We don't, you know, as long as we remain in God, we yes. last forever. Yes, we? that's right. We're yes. never going to die. Because he and gives us gone, abundant yeah. life, eternal that's life. That's right. He gives yeah. us abundant life and we talk about the fruits. We do. Fruits of the Spirit. Yeah. We, we do. The things that should be seen in our lives, which should be evident to other Christians, and evident to the world. They might react differently in the world to as the crafts, but they should be they should be recognized that they are in our lives. Yes. It's good, isn't it, really? It is, it's really good. good for sure. It's good we should produce fruit, shouldn't we? We I should, sure. definitely good yeah. fruit as yeah. well. Yeah. Now no, on, I man. know that you have an interest in coins. And did you know, Dave, that there used to be in Hockley yeah. It's in Hockley, Birmingham, UK. Their pennies, they used to look a little bit different because yes. they had a little capital H. And my ah, husband right. told me when he was a boy that he found yeah. a couple. Right. And, and they were quite rare, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. And he also found a Thrupney bit yeah. in yeah, Sandwell yeah. Valley in the Midlands, yeah. UK. Yeah. Now, I know yeah. that he mentioned to me that pennies had this lovely kind of smooth edges around That's them. That's right, it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they were filed down by the bank workers, apparently, yeah. because they were made of, like, precious metal. Metals. So that they could put these serrations on the edges of the coins yeah. to yeah. stop them from filing and selling of them. That's right. Now, I, yeah. I know that coins are mentioned in the Bible, but what yeah. does this actually mean to you? Well, it's interesting you should say that because there was a mint in Hockley. Yes. I did a little bit on it. It was in Soho Road. Okay. And actually it was the world's largest, largest privately owned mint oh. in the world at one time. It started in 1817, and it was called the Soho Mint. It's not surprising that he found coins in Samuel Valley, because it's not far from actually the Soho Mint. So there could have been. And also, you've got the monastery in Samuel Valley, so it could have been early money. But if you're talking about threatens, that would, would not have been... Uh, the the old threatens which had like a poured colish that we associate pre decimal. This would have been a silver one. A little, only about uh, eight mil diameter, small, 
and that that would be the silver threepence. And it, it was interesting what you said as well about the outside, the mill edge, they call it. That's to that is to prevent wear, but it's also to prevent fraud. Yes, yeah. of course, of course. That's very right, cool, and uh, it's very interesting. Uh, and there was another uh, instance. Henry the Eighth did a few little tricks with coins. He, he, he alloyed them with, mixed them with other metals of lesser degree, but was still giving them out as if they were silver coins. Oh. You see? Okay. So he could keep the rest to himself. You see? Now, that is sometimes the way things are manipulated, isn't it? Now, the other interesting thing was, was the coronation. It was only a few weeks ago. I've got a coin here and I'll show it to you. It's not worth a lot because I sent for it. It's a free one. You can get them. And um, if I've got it, it's here somewhere. I must have took it out of the packet. I've got it all planned. <laughs> and um, my coin my coin has, has disappeared for one minute. You'll find it's, it in a second. You will find it. Yeah. <laughs> it's under all these papers. <laughs> but uh, anyway, how did it happen? Oh, there it is. Look, it must be a disappearing look. coin like the one <laughs> with the widow. <laughs> look, that's it. Come out of the packet there, right? That's the coin. I, I, I don't think it Could is. Could you so, hold that to the camera, please, Dave? Can you see it? Oh, beautifully clear now. Yeah, yeah wow. Yeah. It and looks very um, silvery, doesn't it? It is. I would say it's silver plated, though, because it wouldn't be, that one wouldn't be. Um, you know, solid silver, you know. Uh, it cost me 250 postage and packing, so, but obviously you can get others, which cost you about 40 pounds each, and they represent the orb and the crown and the scepter and everything, but it is interesting. And and there is, um, the, the the actual mint that was, we're talking about the mint in Birmingham is still actually, going ahead, although it was closed down because obviously the Royal Mint in London takes precedence over everywhere. The Birmingham Mint was closed down. It is re relocated in Kidderminster, but it's only like a symbolic. I don't think it really produces any more coins anymore. And there's, and there's an actual museum in Birmingham that represents the old, uh, the old mint. Uh, the other thing was, this this coronation, where there's going to be a new king, there's also going to be new coinage. Now, the, obviously, the coinage run, runs alongside the old coinage. They don't get rid of all the coins with Queen Elizabeth's head on, but eventually, her face will disappear. And then his face will appear more um, obvious to everybody. Um, now, there was something else that was on the other night. It was on the television and, and somebody made a mistake. Um, I don't know whether you see, you look at um, a quiz and it's called the 1% Club. Have you seen it? I don't no, know whether I, you have. I've never seen it, Dave. No. And what it is, Lee Mack is the uh, adjudicator, really, for want of a better term. And um, there was a question on there and it was a simple question. It was for, for 100,000 or 99,999 pounds, it was because you have to get through all the way to the end. And there was two people who answered it. And the, the question was basically if you added all the denominations of all the banknotes that are in circulation today, along with the coins that are produced by the Bank of England, what would the total amount be? Well, the answer was eight hundred and eighty pounds, and sorry, no, eighty-eight pounds. I'll get it right, and eighty-eight pence. That was the answer that was given, and they both had a share of ninety-nine thousand pounds. However, it was the wrong answer. They made a mistake, and the reason why they made a mistake was, was because banknotes are produced by the Bank of England. But coins aren't. They're produced by the raw mint. So there was a mistake in the question itself. 
Somebody said it was said by Americans. I hope Tim's not listening. But <laughs> anyway, <is. laughs> he probably is. But that's what they said. That the question may have come from America for this show. And they hadn't realised that Banknotes Bank of England, the mint coins, you see. Right. And uh, it was interesting. And there is another connection to Christianity and coins. Now, there's a, 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 um, a judicial practice, which a ceremony, which is called the trial of the picks. Now, it sounds, you know, fantastic, but picks is Latin, pixis, which means a small wooden box. Now, what's that got to do with Christianity? Well, in the early days, the sacraments, the bread, was kept in a pix, right? Now, England or, or Britain ex, uh, uh, took that symbol and they, they mint coins in it. Now, whether that shows that they've lost any uh, devaluing spirituality for capital, I don't know, but that's what actually happened. So now, when the first coins are produced, they're actually tested to see, you know, you were talking about, they took, they were falling them off some of the workers. Yes. But the king was allowing them, but now they're tested once a year in Goldsmiths Hall in London by the new Isaiah, because when the Queen died, the old Isaiah was replaced by Charles's new one, who, who runs it. And they test these coins to make sure they're pure. Wow. So they're actually representing what they say they are. Yes. You know, the value and everything. It's very interesting. They call it the trial of the picks. I never knew and that. And is a little coin in the box, which they test every year. And it's very interesting, really. What do you um, make of the coins in the Bible? Ah, now, there are a few coins, mind you. And obviously, the, I would think the most famous would be the 30 pieces of silver. Yes. But I don't want to mention that. I don't want to mention the, uh, the, the money that was used to betray Jesus. Mm. But I want to sort of mention there was another couple of occasions. There may have been more, but there's two that stuck to my mind was uh, the one when the Pharisees uh, and the Herodians they was talking to Jesus and they were trying to catch him out. They asked him about the tribute money, which what it, what it was, and it was an annual tax that was paid to whoever was in charge. I think it was Herod at the time, Caesar. Uh, and um, it was usually a drachm or half a shekel. And, it, um, and what it was, Jesus looked at the coin and basically said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's when he looked at the coin. And he was basically saying, we pay, pay for the things that you can see, but also pay for the things you can't see, really, to put it in basics. I, I know he meant that you should pay your tax to Caesar and and not be be short in coming to customs within your own society in which you live, provide, but also to be prepared to give to God the things that you can't see but are even more real to you and more needful, really. You know? So that was interesting. And then there was another one where I tried to catch him out again. Uh, because um, they, said, they didn't say to him directly, they sort of pressurised Peter and said, when are you going to pay the tribute money for the temple? Because Jews had to pay so much money to the temp for the upkeep of the then temple when he was on earth. It was a day's wage, apparently. It was a lot of money. So Jesus told him, don't worry about that. Go and find a fish and catch the fish and then 
when you catch it, there'll be a coin in the in the in the fish's mouth, and that's what he did. Peter by faith went, and he was under pressure really when you think about it, because it was a it was a day's wage, a denarius, yeah, a denarius for poll tax. Jesus, yeah. um, what can we say? It he didn't major on wealth, obviously, because when he came to earth. He showed to us, he gave up his wealth and privilege, really, to come to, to, to us with coins. Then he showed respect to the authorities that were around at the time. He didn't want to find dispute because it's quite easy to fall out with things. There's so many things as a Christian that you don't agree with. I mean, just going on to another point, I don't want to go totally off this point. But Christ, a lot of uh, people criticise him because when he was on earth, there was slavery. I know it's probably not the same slavery that we think about, but there, there was slavery. And he never preached against slavery. He went along with it because he was more interested that he didn't want men to be slaves to sin. That was what he was majoring on, and he knew that it would take him away from what he was doing. It could be even sometimes the most worthy causes can take us away from the greatest worth, the greatest cause that God wants us to do. Things can distract us that we don't really realize. They're not wrong in themselves. But they take up the place in our lives where God wants us to function in. You know, I've had to learn that in my life. That that's something out as you go along in life, isn't it? Yeah. And you and understand. That's right. And that's a good lesson for it us is. to learn. Now, yeah. Dave, you talked about the creativity yeah. of yeah. gardening. And That's I right. guess coins, in a sense, I mean, coins are all different and they can look yeah, rather creative. Crazy. Yeah. Now, yeah. briefly tell us, you are a novice at DIY. Now, that's yeah. a creative thing to do. Just yeah, yeah. tell us a little bit about that to finish with, please. Right. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm going on a bit. I know I know that. Right, DIY. You're not ready. <laughs> DIY. I mean, do you find yeah. it fulfilling? I do. I find it fulfilling. Obviously, being a train engineer, you have to work with hands. Yes. So you're halfway there. And a lot of times with DIY, you're working with different material rather than metals. You're working with wood. But I do like working with wood because it's a living material. It's it's a yes. material that, you know, is a natural material. That's point like this. Um, and I think it helps you to understand how things are made. You know, processes are important because they're not only um, mould of the thing you're making, but they mould the person who's making them as well. That's the thing. Yeah. You learn a lot from putting things together. It's a life um, skill. It is, yeah, it is. And also you learn... Uh, to value the other people that can do it better than you. Yes. That's another thing. Yes. There's another aspect to it because you're, you're learning things and then you think he's up, you know? But we all have to learn. And, of course, when I was in uh, engineering, I used to say, the man that never made a mistake has never made anything. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> they used to say that to me. So, uh, and, uh, and you do learn by example and training, but you also learn by trial and error. Yeah. And do well. you think that God gives us this skill and ability to make things? Because he's given us moving arms, hasn't he? Yeah, and hands. I suppose he does. Yeah. yeah. To shape, um, to shape the, the visible environment around us. There is a scripture that says, for we are his workmanship, his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus, spiritually transformed, renewed, 
ready to be used. Yeah. Uh, uh, and um, it's, a, it's a wonderful scripture, that is good yes, work that God has prepared for us to do. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. would certainly agree with you there. It is, isn't it? The, yeah. Yeah, with the, yeah. the Lord's workmanship. Yeah. Um, yeah, we are. He's creating us. He's making yes. us better. Yeah. yeah. We've got a That's very right. creative... We're his DIY God. project, are we? <laughs> we, <Yeah>. are. <laughs> we are. I mean, I the DIY... His DIY. <laughs> if you want to put it like that. It um, can be satisfying, DIY, yeah. and you often oh, see it's a popular um, hobby, oh, yeah. shall we say, because yeah. people like to dip in and out of That's right. DIY well, stores. I think it, it became a bit more popular in, uh, after the war because... Um, probably 50s and 60s started to take off because people had got more disposable income. Right. So, uh, and also, uh, the price of tradesmen did go higher. Mm. So basically, rather than get somebody else in to do it, they did it themselves. You know what I'm trying to say? And, and, yes. and in doing it themselves, they found fulfilment through it. And because he developed them as people, they thought, well, I never thought I could do that. But you never do until you've tried it, do you? No, exactly. Anything, you know, you no. know, it's like with the what the scriptures are, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, if you don't taste. You won't know. You won't know. But a lot no. of people pass opinion about God before they've actually tasted and see what, what the Lord can do. Yes. I don't think you can do anything really and realise the value of anything until you've committed yourself. There's a very non-committal world today, mm. in one sense, because it's as if there's a fear. This is why I think one of the reasons why marriage and things like that, because there's a fear that... Uh, she's not the right person or he's not the right person. So we won't do that until we've almost tested them. But it don't work like that in relationships or in in love. There must be a commitment, a desire, you know. So as Christians, um, God creates the desires within us. Yes, he does. He you really know, does. And when he creates the desires, we do things for him, you know, and we accomplish things for him in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, it's, Dave, that yeah. is a great place to finish. So it is, it? Yeah. it's been interesting listening to hear yeah. about what you enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. as a break to read about or yeah. do. Yeah. So, Dave, yeah. thank you today for joining oh, me great. for Give Me a Break. Thank yeah. you, Dave. Yeah, thank thank you for asking me, Jeannie. You I are could welcome. have said a lot more about the coins, <laughs> but to coin a phrase, <laughs> I have to put it short. Thank you, Dave. Bless you. Thank God you. Bless. Thank you. God bless. God bless you. There was um, a process. It was a ceremony, mm. and up until the uh, I think it was sixteen ninety eight was the last time it was done. It was done, done on Morn, Morn Day Thursday, yeah. where, now listen to this, the then king or queen would go out into the street yeah. and they would wash beggars' feet, literally. And wow. that was to follow the example of Christ, yeah. washing the disciples' feet before Good Friday, because it was on Thursday, the Monday Thursday. Now... I think it was William III was the last bloke to do that. Then all the other monarchs replaced it by giving coins out. Okay. So the very act of, uh, of um, what can we say, humbling yourself and providing a service to the poor was replaced by giving them a monetary token. Amazing. And that's where the, yeah, and that's where the morn day money comes in. Oh. And that was a silver coin, uh, one to up to one to four pence, I think. One uh, denominations of one pence, two pence, three pence, or four pence they could be. And they were given by the king or queen 
to the poor. And they still do that today. They do. They do. Yeah. Yeah. The interesting pensioners. fact. Yeah. yeah, they do. But but really, that's a little bit poor as compared to humbling yourself and actually washing the beggar's feet that oh, you yes. actually serve. Yes. Like our Lord, you know. Yes, how true. Maybe they didn't feel it was very... Um, um, uh, what was it? Convenient for them to do it. It, it didn't. Um, there was. I think the emphasis moved to more towards glory in him, men, and yeah. you know, yeah. what it's like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I yeah. always think because um, I'm not a great. I, I love coins, but I'm not a great royalist. But I'm not extreme where I'd abolish them. But 